Welcome to lecture 7. This is a lecture about two sample tests and label shift. So previously we looked at generalization performance and how the fact that our test distribution isn't quite the same as the empirical distribution that we train on affects the fact that we can have a discrepancy between, well, training error and test error. We also saw what happens with covariate shift, namely when the distribution of the covariates, namely the x's, is different from the y on the training and test set, while you know p of y given x is the same. We also encountered adversarial data and invariances. And now the last thing that we're going to cover is label shift. So this is when the distribution, the label distribution itself lies. And so in other words, this is a case where p of y and q of y are different, but unlike before where, you know, we had samples from, you know, the x distribution on training and test set, we don't really have the label distribution, right? After all, that's the goal of our entire approach to estimate <clears throat> whether, you know, and what the labels are. So it's kind of tricky. So in order to do this really well, <clears throat> we need to do something else first. Namely, we need a little bit of statistical tools for comparing distributions. <clears throat> so this goes under the moniker of two sample tests. And <clears throat> to some extent, we already covered those previously when we looked at, uh, for instance, you know, uh, covariate shift, but let's now cover this a little bit more formally. So two sample tests are simply tests to establish whether P and Q are the same. <clears throat> so you can easily see that, you know, having P of X and Q of X being different is a very easy special case <clears throat> of what we have here. But the goal here is now to see whether we can de design general such tests. So for instance, if I gave you this distribution of real cats and dogs and cartoon cats and dogs, <clears throat> then it would be very easy for you to distinguish those two. And, you know, there are a couple of ways how to do it. So let's start with the definition of exactly what the two sample test is, which we've been kind of using it already in the past. <clears throat> now what we can do is we actually want to just build such a simple test. Okay. So the formally, what you get is that, you know, given some data X that's drawn from distribution P, right? So we know that the XI's are drawn from P of X and we have the X primes drawn from Q. So these guys, XJ's prime is drawn from Q of X. We want to test whether P equals Q. The null hypothesis is that this is true. So let's just So usually the null hypothesis in a statistical test is that nothing special happened, that you cannot distinguish things, that things are independent and so on. So basically <clears throat> the key is that, you know, the null is the thing that is usually the simple case. And then your statistical test will go to prove that instead of that, some specific special property holds, right? So there are a couple of algorithms how we can get this. And the simplest one we've already encountered before is namely, let's just train a classifier. And if we can distinguish the data sets, then, you know, by definition, we have P is not equal to Q because I have then just designed, you know, some function which, you know, will primarily output one for one class and minus one for the other class or zero, right? That depends on how you set up your logistic regression. The alternative is we can set up something called maximum mean discrepancy and we'll cover that a little bit later, but it's basically trying to find the function within, you know, some restrictive class of functions such that the P expectation of this function minus the Q expectation of this function are really large. 
Mind you, if we, for instance, have a classifier, right? So we have some function, you know, y hat of x, then if I were to plug in y hat of x here and also there, then I would get exactly the expectation that under p, you know, y hat of x, you know, the outputs, and I would pre prefer to them to be one. And here I would prefer them to be minus one, right? So there's plus one, there's minus one here. And so therefore you can already see that if I have a classifier that can distinguish the two classes, then I could easily go and use that to, for instance, you know, find evidence based on MMD. Likewise, if I have some function f that is primarily large for p and small for q, then I can, in most cases, fashion this into a classifier. So to some extent, MMD is a little bit more generous because, I mean, obviously you could engineer yourself some classifiers that have, you know, zero accuracy or just, you know, chance level accuracy and at the same time still have a large MMD value, but the converse is not true. The last thing that I can do, and this is information theory, is to, well, just look at the difference in bits that I require to encode data drawn from P under the code suitable for P and the code suitable from Q. So just to explain this a little bit more, well, I can expand this into the P expectation of minus log Q of X minus the entropy of P. And we know that the, this is basically the bits needed in order to encode X based on the code Q. So that after all that's, you know, the one of the fundamental theorems in information theory that you need exactly as many bits as, you know, you, the negative log probability of that event, right? That would be the Shannon limit and that's why the entropy comes from. So basically the KL divergence tells me the excess number of bits that I need to invest in order to encode something by using the wrong code, namely Q, versus the optimal code, namely the one for P. So if you had to partition this, this is essentially a reduction approach. So it reduces things to binary classification. This is spectral. And this is information theory. Right. And all those three tools can give you workable algorithms. And you will typically, for a lot of the problems that we encounter, see one of those three approaches in order to solve the problem. Now let's start with the reduction approach. So the reduced to classification or regression. And it's very straightforward. Namely, all you do is you just import from Autoglow and Tabular, you import the Tabular predictor you then use, you know, the, you train the predictor, that's this fit function, and then you invoke it to invoke predict, right? And this, if it works, will give you accuracy that's better than chance level with a suitably, you know, on, on your test set. And if that's the case, and you know, there's a large enough margin, then we know that things are good. Okay, so let's actually work to that in a little bit more detail in math, but basically, you know, this is a perfectly reasonable and very quick off the shelf way in three lines of code to classify things. So the first thing that I need to do is, well, I can look at the classifier objective. So in the classifier objective, what I have is that when data is drawn from P, then 
well, we have, you know, the x, the log likelihood of, you know, pi of y equals one. And this is the log likelihood of, you know, pi of y equals one given x. That's basically, you know, the term. Now this objective, and I forgot the few terms here, namely we really have one half up front. And we want to minimize the negative log likelihood, so we get this as well. But if I want to minimize that, you can easily see that for any location x, this is minimized for exactly the class conditional probabilities, right? Because if you know we have some distribution x, uh, a p, and we have some other distribution q, then then at any location x. Right, so this is where x is. It's that ratio. So this would be p of x. This is q of x. It's that ratio that governs how much more likely q, uh, well, x is drawn from q than from p. And so therefore, since I have a total density of really it's one half, p of x plus q of x, then obviously the probability that it's drawn from p is given by one half p of x over one half p of x plus q of x, right? And so that will then, you know, obviously if I use that as my probability estimate, that minimizes that objective. So. If I then plug this solution back into the original optimization problem, I get exactly, you know, P of X minus log P of X plus Q of X. And here I get the Q of X minus log P of X plus Q of X. That's exactly these terms plugged in here. And now I can collect entropy terms. So the log p of x ep, that's just h of p, right? The same thing holds true for this term here. And then the last thing that I have left is the p and the q expectation, right? So we basically have the p plus q expectation here, and here it's log of p plus q. Now log of p plus q what I really have to do, actually, I have to divide by two, multiply by two, right? And that's exactly where the, you know, factor two comes from. And mind you, we have, of course, the P expectation plus the Q expectation. That's two times one half that expectation. So this is why we get know, twice the entropy of the mixture. And here we get twice the log two, right? Now let's look a little bit what that actually means in practice. It means that we are taking the difference between the entropy of the mixture and the mixture of the entropies. Now, since the entropy itself is a convex function, so therefore we know that the mixture of the entropies will be larger than the entropy of, well, than the entropy of the mixture. Okay, so, sorry, entropy is a, the negative entropy is a convex function. So the entropy looks like so, remember. And so if this is maybe P, H of P, and maybe here is, so here we have H of P, here we have H of Q, and this is the mixture, of the entropies, then for, you know, H of P plus Q over two, this is larger than the term below. That's because, well, the entropy itself is a concave function or the negative entropy is a convex one. Okay. So that's just to explain a little bit why this is a well-behaved term. And obviously we know that if P equals Q, then this entire thing 
well, it doesn't quite vanish. We still get the two log two term left, but that's the same throughout. So we therefore know that using a classifier gives me a very well-formed objective. And thus I've just proven that the reduction to classification is perfectly feasible and actually corresponds to meaningful quantities, also in terms of information theory. Okay. So let's look at MMD, maximum mean discrepancy. So probably the easiest way to see this is, so we're trying to find some function within some restrictive class of functions for which the expectation under P is much larger than the expectation on, on the Q, right? Um, so why do I need to restrict the class of functions? Well, because if I didn't, I could just easily go and you know scale up that test function by a factor of 100, and then that discrepancy would also scale up by a factor of 100, so that entire objective would become pointless. So that explains a little bit why you need to restrict this to some bounded function class f. And we'll look at some of those interesting classes of functions in a moment. But let's look at some concrete data. So here's some data that I've drawn actually from two normal distributions. I mean, I didn't tell you that, but basically the blue dots are drawn from a normal distribution that looks like so. And the orange ones are drawn from a normal distribution that looks like so. Okay. This is probably the ugliest normal distribution that you've seen, but let's just suppose for the sake of the argument that these are the two normal distributions. So in this case, we know that in this region up here, I have a lot more, let's say, P's. If this is, you know, my P distribution, and if this one down here is my Q distribution, Right, And then I also know that in the region below, well, I have a lot more data drawn from the Q distribution. So therefore, I would expect that any function f would need to be large in here and f very negative in here. And so if you now actually look at what the solution of this optimization problem is for you know some function class that we'll cover in a moment, namely kernels, you can see that this is pretty much what's happening, right? Here's the zero. And you see that exactly in the region where we have a lot of blue data, this function here is positive. And in the regions where we have a a lot of the orange data, right? That's where it's negative. And that gives me a very discriminative function to distinguish between the P's and the Q's. Now, of course, you might wonder, you know, how did Alex get this green function? And it turns out that this is literally a single line of uh, GPyTorch code. So I'll show you that in a moment. Let's first look at what it actually means in math. So remember, we want to find the function that has the largest difference in expectation between two distributions. This is actually a really, really old concept. Um, so Forte and Mourier in 1943, if I recall correctly, came up with this idea. And if you recall history, well, this is the time when people were shooting each other quite a bit. So this idea was promptly forgotten for decades. And well, sort of kind of persisted. Uh, we rediscovered some of this um, when we looked at kernel methods. Um, but basically, this is really an old idea, as it should be. Now, if we have linear functions in Banach space, Right, So that basically just means that my function can be written as a dot product between some representation or feature map and some weights. 
So you can call it feature map. You can also now call it representation. So in the 90s, you would have called it feature map. And in the 2010s plus plus, you would call it representation. And that's just because one is deep learning speak. The other one is kernel speak. And this is just your weight. The big difference is that if you do deep learning, then phi of x is eminently learnable. If you do use kernels, then there's a lot of engineering that goes into it. But other than that, you know, that logic persists. And in order to restrict the power of the functions, I require that the norm of the vector be bounded by one. And so if I do that, I can show that the sup over w of ep of phi of x minus e, eq of phi of x, right? Because I can pull this together by linearity. Now I have a sup between some vector here and another vector there. And this is really straight textbook dual norms in Banach spaces. This happens to be then the norm of the first vector. Now, if you've never heard of Banach spaces, just treat those as standard L2 norms. And here's the geometric picture of what happens. Let's say this is some vector. And I have some other vector with bounded norm. So this is an L2 ball. Then the inner product between the yellow vector and the red vector will be maximized if both of them are perfectly aligned, right? That will be basically my W star. And so now the inner product between this, you know, vector of unit length, W, so the yellow vector, and the arbitrary test vector, that would be exactly the length of this vector. Let's just call this vector V. And so we know that the inner product between V and W star equals V. Right. Now, if my norm has very different shapes, so for instance, you know, if the unit ball happens to be hypercube, right, then the optimization problem that I drew up here with the red vector may have a solution that picks out, let's say, one of the vertices here. So the solution of that optimization problem depends very much on the geometry of the yellow object. But for the purpose of what we're going to do here, let's assume that this is actually nice and essentially a possibly infinite dimensional version of the <clears throat> Euclidean space. So this is the length of the difference in feature space. Okay. So if I use kernels, I can actually work this out very nicely. Namely, I can <clears throat> get the difference, right? So between P and Q, that's this feature map difference. And so now I can actually get the adversary function. Because the adversary function is exactly the one that, you know, exhibits this the most. So I can, you know, take the inner product between the means and expectation and the evaluation functional here, so phi of x prime. And so now this is exactly the test function that will exhibit the largest discrepancy. Now, since we don't have the actual distributions at hand, well, what we end up doing is we end up just drawing samples from it. And so this blue bit here is exactly the test function that we looked at previously. So if you recall this blue fun this green function here, this is exactly computed by using you know, this formula. Furthermore, the formula below will give you an unbiased estimate of the discrepancy between the two terms. Now, one little detail here is I'm excluding i equals j, and that just has to do with the fact 
that if I have a kernel that's just dominant on the main diagonal, then I can get, you know, bad results. Okay, but the blue function is probably more interesting here. So let's just, you know, work that through directly in code. So P and Q are just, you know, samples from the normal distribution. So those are the actual, dot, you know, lines of code that produced the dots before. Now I want to evaluate the function, test function on this, on the interval between minus three and three, right? So this is all fake data. And so now all I have to do is I have to instantiate a kernel. And this actually instantiates a kernel with width one, and I could do something a little bit fancier, but this is easy. And then now K of X and P just constructs a kernel matrix, right? Likewise, K of X and Q constructs one. And then I just need to multiply by WP and WQ. And these are just vectors. WP is simply the vector of one over a hundred. 1 over 100, and it's 100 terms long. And likewise, WQ. So this is all that I need to compute the difference between the expectations in feature space. Okay. So this is a very useful and quick and dirty diagnostic. If let's say you have you know, some data and you quickly want to find a function that's particularly large for one distribution and not so large for another one, you take some feature map. If you don't know what to do, just use an RVF kernel. Otherwise, if for instance, you already have some features from your deep network, use those. And then you can easily work out what the maximum mean discrepancy is. As a quick aside, if you, let's say, had some ImageNet features, then what you would do is, so let's say I have, you know, pictures of cats and dogs. Okay, I'm terribly bad at drawing cats, but let's say this is a cat. Then um, you map this already into, for instance, a ResNet feature. And so now what you would do is you would take the sum over all the data, I going from one to M of, you know, my phi of XI, one over M minus, you know, the same thing, one over M prime, I going from one to M prime, phi of XI prime, right? So those would be, you know, the other data set. So this is the P distribution, that's the Q distribution. And now I get from that a vector V. And then the function that I would get is basically, I would have, you know, phi of, you know, whatever image that you have. So this is the representation transposed with V. And that would be now my function And this function will now be large if data tends to be drawn from, let's say the cat distribution, and it might be very negative if it's drawn, let's say from the dog distribution. Okay. This is a very, very cheap way of designing a classifier. Furthermore, if the length of the vector V is meaningful, then you can say, well, yes, we probably have some coverture. Now, if I have one dimensional data, things tend to be easier still. And this actually corresponds to a statistical tool that was invented in the 1930s. So this is Kolmogorov and Smirnov worked this out. And basically what they did is they looked at functions with bounded total variation. Okay. So a function of bounded total variation, and I'm just writing the differentiable case here um, I'm not going to worry about all the technical niceties otherwise, 
is just one where the integral over the absolute value of its derivative is bounded. And the value of that integral is the total variation. Now you can easily see that if my function is not differentiable, then I can just, you know, but still continuous, I can take, you know, well, I can basically, actually even for discontinuity, I can just use step functions, right? And I just have smaller and smaller intervals. And then I use that to aggregate over the overall variation of that function. And that's my total variation, right? So for instance, I can spend all my smoothness budget on something like this. So in that case, the total variation would be just whatever my delta is here. I can also spend my smoothness budget on something like this. And assuming that this is delta again, the cost would actually be two delta because I have to jump up and then I have to jump down again. Or of course I can, you know, change it like this, you know, that's entirely up to you. So let's actually look at two examples to give a bit, get a bit more of an intuition as to which one is bounded variation or not. And just to give it away before we start any derivatives, this has bounded total variation and this one doesn't. And I'm actually only really interested in, you know, the integral of this total variation functional up to some constant here, rather than going all the way to infinity. So to see why this first term has bounded total variation, well, let's actually cheerfully take the derivatives. So dx of this entire term happens to be just 2x sine x to the minus one. Okay, so, so far we are good, right? Because this is bounded by one. The sine is bounded by one and two x, well, is also bounded by, yeah, two x. Okay, so this is overall bounded by two x. And then we have another term, right? And that's x squared times now the cosine of x to the minus one times, now we need to take the derivative of one over x, and that's minus one over x squared. So therefore the total expression is two x sine one over x minus cosine one over x. And we can see that this entire thing here is bounded by basically 2x plus 1. So just being generous. And of course, therefore, the integral here up to some term exists. It's nice bounded and continuous, so everything's good. Now, if you look at the second term, I'm going to spare you the derivatives here, but um, you can see, okay, we'll get basically something like sine x to the minus one minus one over x cosine to the f the x minus one. That's the derivative. And you can see that this term here is what gives us big headache because this can get very, very large around zero, right? So if I had to look at the envelope of this thing here, right, this, this is a monster. So therefore the integral will not be bounded. And as a matter of fact, the total variation of this is unbounded. Okay. So this is just to get a little bit of intuition and basically total variation is a convenient way of checking for the complexity of a function. So what I can do therefore is I can say, well, I'm interested in all functions of bounded variation for which the P expectation is larger than the Q expectation. And it turns out, and this is a little bit of constrained optimization that I'm going to skip here, that the best way 
of looking at the difference in the expectation of the total variation is to say, well, up to some point, the function is, let's say, zero, and then after that, it's all one. So this is also called the Heaviside function. Right. And so therefore, what this means is that under my two distributions, I'm looking at the P expectation here of basically, you know, X less equal than Z minus the Q expectation for X less equal than Z. Um, so I've actually picked that function here, right? So the negative heavy side function. So it's one all the way up to Z and then it's zero. And so therefore, under this blue function, you know, if I have, you know, some distribution, whatever, I'm just measuring the weight of this term here. And then if I had, you know, Q, and Q is maybe, you know, really small here, and then it gets larger, then again, I'd be only measuring this weight here. So you can see why this will give us a good indication for the discrepancy between two functions. Now that's the same thing, right? Because this is just the cumulative distribution function. That's nothing else than FP of Z. And that's FQ of Z. And now the soup over Z of the difference between those two things is just the L infinity norm. That's, you know, literally just rewriting terms. And this gives me a very simple statistic for comparing two distributions. Mind you, there are other distances between them. For instance, some people use the L in, the L1 norm between P and Q. And ideas like that will actually give you the Wasserstein distance. And if you look at for paper, look for papers, this has gotten quite popular recently in the form of what's called a WGAN. And a lot of the reason for that has to do with the fact that the original adversarial tests had a lot of deficiencies in terms of being able to detect that things are different. So that's why we picked that. So therefore we get the kolmogorov smirnov statistic. And here I've drawn the empirical cumulative distribution functions for the red and the green dots. And you can see that I'm now after the largest difference between the P and the Q distribution. And that just happens to be here. So this is nothing else therefore than FP minus FQ. You can see that this is smaller than, for instance, this term here or that one there. And obviously, you know, moving further up would do exactly nothing because the blue CDF just continues. After all, we know that both of them have to hit one at some point or at least asymptote to it if they have unbounded support. Okay, so just to sum it up a little bit, what we basically therefore get is we want to, if we want to check whether X and X prime are drawn from the same distribution, the first thing to do is train a classifier. If it works, the samples are different. So start there. Why? Because usually you already have some classifier handy. So running this will help you. As a matter of fact, one of the homeworks is to do exactly that. The second one would be to use maximum mean discrepancy. It's relatively easy to generate the discriminator without training, so you could do that. And the last thing, if you actually have a one-dimensional distribution, then the kolmogorov smirnov statistic and test are really useful to get you there. So to, you know, let you just to drive that message home, you should really perform sanity checks to confirm that the distributions match. If they do, you're in good shape. If not, well, you'll probably have to do something a little bit more careful.
So this concludes the first part of this lecture and we'll see you in a moment shortly.